God is good. And all the time. I've gotten into the habit of listening to the Word of God when I'm getting ready and when I'm in my car. And I was listening to 2 Timothy today. And when this verse came into my hearing, it resonated with me. And just put, as I said to somebody tonight, a smile on my heart. I read, I know whom I have believed. I know. And I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What have you entrusted to God? And what do you know to be true about him? I know I serve a risen Savior. I know I have a God who cares about the things that are concerns to me. I know I have a God who never sleeps and never slumbers. I know a God who can cause me to scale a wall. I mean, look at me, people. Do you think I could scale a wall? But I read in the Word of God, with my God, I can scale a wall. I know that I serve a God who is living and active in the world today. He is sovereign. He is all-knowing. Nothing catches him by surprise. What do you know to be true? I know the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin. I know the Holy Spirit has been sent as a deposit and a guarantee sealing me and my heart and my life and my story. Your story is being written by the sovereign hand of God. Do you know that tonight? Do you know that you have the victory through your Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know that when you pray, you have an audience in the throne room of heaven with the God who can, as I said Sunday, the God who has and the God who will? What do you know? I know whom I have believed. And that's why I'm showing up tonight because he's worthy. He's worthy of not just honor, glory, and praise because of who he is, but he's worthy of the gratitude from our hearts because of all that he has done in our lives. Would you stand and just adore him with me? Give him your very best tonight. Lord, we honor you.
the Hudson family to the platform. I don't know if y'all saw the church Facebook page, but um, I encouraged, if you did see it, to wear blue tonight. And you all get to be the something blue in the wedding of Shane and Cynthia Hudson tonight. Will you welcome them to the platform? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, Shane, you're on this side. Cynthia, on this side, just like we didn't practice it. What I want you to understand tonight is that you are seeing two people who have surrendered their lives to Jesus. Who say, I want my life to line up with Scripture. Now, I want to tell you that this isn't the first time they're doing this. They were married to each other. They divorced. The Lord has brought about a transformation in their lives and hearts. And in the presence of God and these witnesses, they are coming back together as a celebration and a testimony. It's testimony night. Taste Valley Church of God. Praise the Lord. So I'm going to ask just the two of you to step right in front here so that the microphone picks you up well. And may I have the rings, please. Praise the Lord. Nobody else is having this happen at their church on a Wednesday night, I guarantee it. Okay. This is Shane's. This is Cynthia's. Okay. Oh, awesome. Will you take the rings then that you have chosen for each other? You take the ring you chose for Cynthia? Okay. All right. Okay, Shane, I'm going to ask you to place the ring on Cynthia's finger and repeat after me, okay? Mm -hmm. Go ahead and place it on her finger. I, Shane, I, Shane take you, Cynthia, thank you, Cynthia, to be my wife, to be my, wife my, constant friend, my constant friend, my faithful partner, my faithful partner and, my love. and my love in the presence of God, in the presence of God I offer you my vow I offer you my vow to be your faithful partner to be your faithful partner in sickness and in health in sickness and in health in good times and in bad in good times and in bad and in joy as well as sorrow and in joy as well as sorrow I promise to love you unconditionally I promise to love you unconditionally so that together we may grow so that together we may grow in the likeness of Christ in the likeness of Christ and our home and our home may be a praise to him may be a praise to him I promise to support you I promise to support you. To honor and respect you. To honor and respect you. To laugh with you and cry with you. To laugh with you and cry with you. To laugh and to cry with you. And to cherish you. And to cherish you. For as long as we both shall live. For as long as we both shall live. All right, Cynthia, you take the ring that you've selected for Shane. Place it on his finger and repeat after me. I, Cynthia. I, Cynthia. You can hold hands at this part. <laughs> <laughs> Take you, Shane. Take you, Shane, again. <laughs> to be my husband, my constant friend, my faithful partner, and my love from this day forward. In the presence of God, I offer you my vow to be your faithful partner in sickness and in health, in good times and in bad. And in joy as well as sorrow. I promise to love you unconditionally. So that together we may grow in the likeness of Christ. And that our home is a praise to him. I promise to support you. 
to honor and respect you, to laugh with you and cry with you, and cherish you for as long as we shall live. All right. Let's pray. Would you stretch your hand toward this couple? All right. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for a home that is now established on the solid rock. We thank you for faithful obedience to your word. We thank you for hearts that are passionate with love for you and for one another. I pray, Lord Jesus, that this moment would be the first of many moments of preferring one another in love, submitting to one another in love, cherishing and celebrating the love that you've given to them. And Lord, I pray that this family would prosper. I pray they'd prosper spiritually. I pray they'd prosper financially. I pray they would prosper, Lord, in every way. Keep them strong and make them a force for the kingdom of God. May many people be won to faith in Jesus Christ because of their commitment to do things God's way. May they feel the blessing of God rest on them. And I pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Well, for as much as Shane and Cynthia have acknowledged God, have, have witnessed before you their love and commitment, one for another by the giving and receiving of a ring, by the authority invested in me as a minister of the gospel according to the laws of the state of West Virginia, I pronounce that you are husband and wife for the second time, <laughs> together in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You may kiss your bride. <laughs> Woohoo! Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Celebrate Mr. and Mrs. Shane Hudson. Praise the Lord. Hammock, hammock, hammock. Okay. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Look what God has done. God bless you. Thank you so much. And we have purchased a cake for them to take home so that they can celebrate with their family. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. All right, stay standing. We're just going to continue to praise the Lord for the new thing that he is doing in our midst. Hey, guess what? We had seven women at our Celebrate Recovery tonight. God's doing something new. He's doing something new. What new thing is he doing in you tonight? What do you need him to do? crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your care. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. I hope this is your prayer. Make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing. given me Jesus bring new wine out of me in the crushing in the pressing you are making new wine in the soil Play. 
And before I call you to prayer, I just want to invite you to pray for the person closest to you, the person in front of you, beside you, behind you. Take a minute and ask God to bless them. Meet them at their point of need. you, God, that we can love one another through the ministry of prayer. We have so many needs, but I'm going to call your attention to just one tonight. Sister Gayla Dowdy, a shut-in for many years now, has gone on to glory. Her celebration of life service is going to be tomorrow at Allen Funeral Home in Hurricane. There's a visitation at 10 o'clock service at 11. Some of you might be thinking, well, I don't know Sister Gala. It's okay. You could show up and say, I attend Taith Valley Church of God. And I just want you to know that I'm praying for you. I know her husband would be so grateful for the support. Lift them up. And I invite you to come and bring the needs out of the prayer pots to come and spend a quiet moment at an altar or maybe visit a prayer counselor as we prepare to pray. Would you come as we sing? When I walk through deep waters, I know that you will be with me. When I'm standing I will not be overcome Through the valley of the shadow I will not fear I am not alone I am not alone You
You're my strength, you're my defender, you're my refuge in the storm. Through these trials, you've always been faithful. You bring healing to my soul. I am not alone. microphone on for you, Pastor. I don't think I got him. I love the scripture about Pastor just talked about scaling a wall. I love the New King James Version. It says leap over the wall. With my God, I can leap over the wall. And I've always had an expectation and this alone thing, I'm alone a lot. Don't you feel sorry for me? I'm alone a lot, but I never am any more than I want to self-pity myself to be because I can talk to Jesus. I have a Catholic friend who just told me again the other day that the reason she liked Jesus serving him, that she wasn't made to feel guilty all the time, going to confession. Secondly, she can talk to Jesus anytime, anywhere. If you knew this lady, she really does. So when we prayed this evening, whether you're not praying directly at what's going on totally, God's grace still takes care of prayers. God's grace still answers prayers. Maybe we didn't specifically lay out. I can tell you that. You don't have time to listen to that, but I want to pray. Father, thank you tonight. You are a prayer answering God. You showed us your most intimate self when you listened to your son pray in the garden of Gethsemane. When you saw what he was facing and you listened to him. But Father, there was a greater purpose And praise the Lord, your son, Jesus Christ, said, not my will, but yours be done. And that's why we're here tonight. That was an answer to prayer. And all through the years and all through our lives, Lord, you've answered prayers, not just done things for us. You've kept us from things happening to us that we didn't know about. You are sweet, Jesus. Yes, you are. I know you know that, but it makes me feel good to say that. And when you come into my presence or I come into your presence, however it goes, it is the highest moments of my life. That's when I am my best, when I'm in your presence. And so, Lord, we bring these prayer requests to you. Those where death has come, those who are fighting and battling terminal illnesses, those who are sick and other things and suffering, those families, Lord, as we've seen here tonight, I pray come back together. Lord, you can pick up the broken pieces 
and you can put them back together. And you made those bodies. You know how to make them work right. We ask you to heal. We ask you, Lord, to renew. And even, Lord, you said, I am the resurrection of life. Do it again, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, brother. Well, I had shared a week or two ago that we were going to look for some testimonies tonight, and I have had three gentlemen tell me that they have something to share. So, Dwayne, would you come on down first, and we'll put you right in front of the communion table, and I'll turn this mic on for you. And after Dwayne, Shane, you get to share your testimony. And after Shane Jeremiah, if you would, since yours is a little longer, come up to the platform. That would be great. Here you go, brother. Hi. I just want to thank the Lord for what he's doing around here. It's incredible. The river of God is just flowing here. All we have to do is step in. And I encourage you, if you haven't stepped in, Come on in because that's where the Lord is moving and flowing and the word of God is just moving in this whole building where the river of God is just flowing through here. I, I, uh, we have a men's conference seminar thing coming up in June. I want to encourage you men to go. The last one I had attended of something like this the Lord just spoke. We had men all over the altar, all over the place. And it's wonderful that pastor gives us a chance to, for us men to get together and, you know, where we can rrr, 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 if we want and nobody. Is that what you're doing? <laughs> yeah. So I encourage you to go to that. You'll never, never, never forget it. So I just want to encourage you to come come to the men's uh, meeting that's coming up in, in, in June. It's going to be a time you'll never forget. Yeah, step into the river with that. That's great. Okay, Shane, you want to hand that off to him? Thank you. Well, I was going to talk about how in two months will be 10 years sobriety for me. But going to call a tiny little audible, and instead of being selfish, I'm going to humble myself and instead pray for everyone that is here, everyone that is home, people that you may know that may be dealing with addiction, mental health problems, that God will save you. He says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will be found. Knock and the door shall be opened. God will always answer that door. Seek him, and he will save you. Amen. The fulfillment of God is more fulfilling than any drink of alcohol. Praise the Lord. Any drug that is shot up, smoked, anything of that nature. I am a living proof that now I have a beautiful family. You all witnessed us getting married today. So there is no one greater than God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You started to preach my sermon. Come on up, Jeremiah. Scoot this forward. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hi, everyone. You may, you probably don't know me. Uh, I'm Jeremiah. I sit in the back. There's a lot of computers there. That's my thing. Um, I, I wanted to talk today about my testimony, and it comes in three parts. And um, the first one, arguably the most important, um, is my mother. I don't know how many of you here have felt the power of a relentless prayer warrior praying over you your entire life, but it is an irreplaceable blessing. Now, my mother is a short, quiet lady who's been coming here even longer than myself, and I believe there hasn't been a day go by that she hasn't wrapped me or our family in prayer. And I wanted to open with that because I wanted to emphasize how important family is. Now, she used to be heavily involved with leadership 
for past churches, and she is really the one who showed me what it means to serve your church and how important that is. Now, I don't think I really truly appreciated everything my mother did for us until I had kids of my own, and I started seeing her treat them how she treats me. And I wouldn't be here today without her endless prayers, so thanks, Mom. Now, for part two, I wanted to talk about my daughter. Um, Sam, my wife, uh, and I had our first pregnancy. We were ecstatic as any couple should be, and we had a lot of trials and tribulations, as most couples do. Um, as it took us over a year for us to finally conceive with our firstborn. Now, during the second trimester, we were told that our daughter had a neural tube defect called anencephaly, and she was going to die. Now, listen, church, we're believers, okay? We believe that we serve a miracle-making, heal-the-blind kind of God, okay? So when they asked if we were going to full term, you know what our answer was. And I want to emphasize here that we spent months in prayer leading up to the C-section, not only asking for healing, but thanking him for already doing his works. Because part of prayer is also believing that God will do the works. Now, as we went into the hospital, we were fully believing she was already healed. Our daughter, Angel Grace, was born on March 7th, 2019. When we saw her and saw that the anencephaly was not, in fact, healed, Sam and I looked at each other, and there was no disappointment. Let me make that clear. We looked proud, and we were very happy. They told us that if she even made it to full term, which was a blessing in itself, she had a life expectancy of 12 seconds. Let me repeat that, 12 seconds. That's shorter than most hugs. We made the difficult decision of not putting her in the NICU we wanted, her, we wanted to hold her for as long as God let her stay with us. We didn't want her to live her short life covered in tubes. Now, 12 seconds turned into 12 minutes. Thank you, Jesus. And we got to enjoy every aspect of having a baby, from pictures to holding her to changing her to hearing her coo or ka and ooh, and our families got to come in and see her. And before you knew it, it was dark out. And when it was finally just Sam and me and our sweet angel, God brought her back to the kingdom. And what I want you to understand is that God took 12 seconds and turned them into 13 hours. We got to enjoy our firstborn when we were told to abort. We got to see life when we were told there would only be death. Whew. Now, when you're grieving, you don't see the full picture. I thanked God for every second he gave me with Angel, but I still questioned him. I, I won't lie. I believe in miracles, and to this day, I still believe he's performing them. But the important part, and what I later learned from this, even comes back to what Pastor David said this Sunday. Uh, it, it's the summary of my testimony, I believe. Um, his, his words were, when you pray, don't expect God to answer your prayer in the way you're praying it. He doesn't need anything he's created to make a prayer work for you. Even with a blessing could come pain, and that pain shouldn't block your relationship with Jesus. Now, Pastor David, I want you to know it took me almost two years after her birth to learn that. It took me years to understand that God didn't give us what we wanted. He gave us what we needed. Because not even two months later, we were pregnant with the biggest bundle of joy you've ever seen. A 100% healthy pregnancy, Sam had no sickness, and that was all because we had the honor of receiving our blessing that was our angel. And then a year later, we had another wonderful little boy named Gabriel. I'm sure you saw them running around. If you were here for dinner, they, that's them. <laughs> uh, I wanted to close with my last point, and that's number three, and that is my church. When COVID hit, we stayed out of church. We had a newborn as Gideon was just born, and after hearing the horror stories of disease and uh, thinking of what we went through with Angel um, happening to Gideon, we, we stayed at home for way too long, let me tell you that. Something happens to you when you're out of the presence of the Holy Spirit for too long, okay? You start to care about church less. You pray less. You, you think about God less. You start to read your Bible less, and you notice... Uh, you notice those things happening. 
Or, I'm sorry, you, you don't notice those things happening slowly over time. And slowly but surely, I started to think about God less and without noticing was losing my relationship with him. Now, Easter of 2022 came. COVID mania had ended and I had received an invitation to Taze Valley Church of God. Wow. We really needed to get back in church when I saw that text message. After repenting for being away for so long before I even walked in the door, we all showed up that beautiful Sunday morning, and I can't tell you anything about that day. I can't tell you much about that service. I don't know if Pastor Melissa was here. The only thing I remember about that service is that I looked around during it, and I felt it. It hit me like an ocean wave crashing over me. I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit that I had been missing for so long, so heavy in this room, and I told Sam we had to stay. I'm telling you guys, it was like the weight of the fine robes of the Father being put around the shoulders of the prodigal, and all I could hear was Pastor Melissa saying, bring the fattened calf. <laughs> and we stayed, and that was the day we made this our church. Um, and do you know who invited me to church here? on Easter Sunday of 2022, my mother. Thanks, Mom. Thank you, guys. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. We are going to receive our midweek care offering, so if our ushers would come and wait on us, if you have a gift to give. If you weren't here Sunday and didn't get to get in on the building fund offering, there's still time to do that. We always take a two-week total because gifts are mailed in. Um, do we have the ways to give that we can put up on the screen? For those who are uh, viewing at home, if this ministry is a blessing to you and, and you want to make a building fund contribution, you, you can do that as well. All right, God bless you all as you give. Um, tonight, we are finishing our series on the armor of God, and we're going to specifically focus on prayer tonight. If you have your Bibles or you want to get your cell phone app open to Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 10, where I'm going to recap the pieces of the armor that we've already gone over. Hear the word of the Lord from Ephesians 6, beginning with verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and here's our verse for tonight, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Tonight, I want to suggest to you that as you're conscious to put on the full armor of God, you also need to have a conscious prayer life. You need to mean to pray. You need to have a God consciousness that comes in and through an ongoing daily connection with God through prayer. Now, Paul begins verse 18 by saying we need to pray in the Spirit. Last week when we dissected the sword of the Spirit, I highlighted that there was a, a connection between the Word of God and the Spirit of God. We talked about how it's called the sword of the Spirit 
because the Spirit gave a special anointing, special inspiration to those who penned the words of Scripture as the Holy Spirit prompted them to do. All Scripture is God breathed. The Spirit breathed it. Consider the Holy Spirit the dictator of the Scriptures. He's certainly the author. They are meant not only to be read, but to be spoken, and they have power. They have power endued from the Holy Spirit. Whenever they are declared, whenever they are received, whenever they are obeyed, there is the power of heaven backing them up. It is a living, breathing document empowered by the Spirit. The Word of God has its origins in the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. The Word of God has its origins in the Holy Spirit. Now we also see this tremendous connection in verse 18 between the Holy Spirit and prayer. Paul says we are to pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Jude 1.20 also tells us to pray in the Holy Spirit. That means every time you pray, the Holy Spirit is to be engaged. Now, let me take you back to the Old Testament. I'm, I'm kind of excited. Um, when we finish uh, this topic, I'm gonna be moving into seeing the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Um, Samson, for example, in the Old Testament, had this strength, right, this special strength, when the Holy Spirit would come upon him. The Holy Spirit would come upon him, this is an Old Testament character, and he would have supernatural strength. He would be able to do divine acts of service, okay? He had Holy Spirit help for a measure of time and for a specific task. We also read about David, a king, a man after God's own heart, and we read how the Holy Spirit was with him. So the Holy Spirit had come upon Samson. The Holy Spirit was with David. But David also prayed out of great concern, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. There was this sense that his connection with the Holy Spirit wasn't guaranteed or permanent, and he knew that. Believers on this side of Pentecost, on this side of the Holy Spirit outpouring that we read about in Acts chapter 2, I want you to know we have a special, unique relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit won't just come upon us and be with us for a moment in time, won't just be near us, but the Holy Spirit is dwelling inside of us. The Holy Spirit is in us, sealing us, working with us, transforming us, fueling us. We need to pray with the confidence that comes from knowing that our relationship to God is dynamic through the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. Because like the Word of God, we now have our origin in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit connects us to every resource that God has. When I go to prayer, it's not just me, myself, and I that is approaching God's throne with a request. But it is me and the Holy Spirit partnering together to ask God to move. We've got to pray and learn to pray with the confidence that comes from knowing the Holy Spirit is our prayer partner. He has united us with Christ so we are one with God. We are in the spirit. We are not of the flesh. We have been born anew. We are not of the flesh. We are in the spirit. So we don't pray by the flesh. We pray by the spirit. We pray out of that relationship, that vine branch relationship. And guess what? Even when we don't know what to say, when we don't know how to articulate what is in our hearts, we are still in the Spirit because the Holy Spirit in us takes over and prays for us when words fail us. That is the Word of God in Romans 8, 26. 
may be a good and right practice as we begin to pray could simply be to bow our heads and say, Holy Spirit, let's do this. (laughs) I often pray, Holy Spirit, give me the mind of Christ so that I can pray according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit is God, so he knows all things. He is the one who's been tasked with leading us into all truth. If we pray to know truth and to express truth as we pray, the Holy Spirit is definitely going to enable that desire. We won't have to twist his arm, right? Just know that you are not alone as you pray. You are praying in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Prayer is also to be ongoing. Paul says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Other translations say we are to pray at all times. In short order, this call to pray at all times is an expression of our dependence upon God. If you're always praying on all occasions, then you're constantly going to be talking to God. If you are constantly talking to God, then you are going to be positioning yourself in the presence of the one with all knowledge, all power, and all authority. And I guarantee you, the more you pray, the more you will experience God's power, and the more you will see him at work in your life. The third thing Paul says in verse 18 is that we should pray with all kinds of prayers. Pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Sometimes we just need to get along with God and thank him for being so good. Thank him for being responsive to our prayers. Thank him for working things out for us. Thank him for opening doors for us. Thank him for cutting through some red tape for us. Thank him for moving our name to the top of some list when it was urgent. Thank him for his protection and for his provision in our lives. Many times when I'm in a waiting room with a family from church and the surgeon comes out and tells us how things went and the news is just almost always positive, right? I say, let's circle up. This is a time to say a prayer of thanksgiving because God has heard our prayer today. What are the other kinds of prayers that we might pray in addition to prayers of thanksgiving? Well, I'll tell you about some of the all kinds of prayers that I pray. This Saturday, I'm going to Columbus, and I'm going to go wedding dress shopping with our daughter. And you better believe that I am already praying that we find the right dress at the right price. I have actually had a very good friend praying for over a month now about that. That's a big deal. When you say yes to the dress, you are saying yes to a certain budget item, right? I know that God is lining something up that's going to be beautiful. I know it. And she's going to love it. In fact, he might even be having somebody return a dress that they didn't just like when they got home, but it's going to be perfect for her, and it'll be right there in the store when we walk in. That's just the way God works. I want you to know I pray for my eyesight my pancreas, my heart, my digestive and circulatory system. I pray for my kidneys on a regular basis. I pray to be healed from diabetes and the slight tremor that I have in my left arm and hand. I pray for God to expand my territory, my husband's territory, our kids' territory. I pray that the territory of this church is just blown wide open. I pray he brings them in from the north, the south, the east, and the west. I pray for financial provision. I pray for wisdom and discernment and decision-making. I pray God tells me when to speak and when to listen. I pray against the devil and his schemes. I pray according to 2 Thessalonians 3, 2, that I will be spared from wicked and unreasonable people. That's Bible. 
I pray for divine spiritual protection. I pray according to the scriptures that I am an overcomer, that greater is he who is in me than Satan who is in the world, that no weapon that he fashions against me will have any impact. I pray for Satan to be ousted, exposed, evicted in every situation when I sense he is present. I pray for every lying, deceiving, deceptive, incarcerating, demonic spirit to be bound in this house of worship. I pray for forgiveness. I pray for a heart check with some regularity. I pray for physical and mental strength. And anybody over 50 knows we need some mental help, right? I pray God will help me sleep at night. We pray when we make big purchases. We want God's blessing on how we spend our money. When we go shopping for a car, that's already been bathed in prayer. I do a lot of intercessory praying. I pray for the needs of the people in the prayer pods, for people as they come to me one-on-one. -on -one. I get a lot of requests to pray for people when they're getting ready to take tests at school. That's a real big prayer time. Maybe when they're testing for a licensure, for a certain certificate. I pray for people who've lost loved ones, for people who need a new job, for those who are getting married, those who are pregnant, those going through divorce. I pray for unsaved people to come to Christ. I pray for people to respond to the messages every time we meet. Sometimes my mouth is moving and I'm reading my manuscript, but at the same time I am praying for Holy Spirit obedience in this house. I pray for a lot of people to be healed. Often I pray for God to use me as I'm going to a hospital or to a shopping mall or to a restaurant. Even with a random stranger, I ask that he'll help me. What if we started praying prayers that thank God for the trials that we're walking through? That's a different kind of prayer. I'm not sure if that made your all kinds of prayer list. To thank God for the hard times. And to ask him to show you how he's refining you and helping you to rely more on him. What if we just echoed the same question that the disciples voiced in Luke 11, 1, when they said, Lord, teach me to pray. Teach me to pray according to your will, Lord. Teach me to pray rightly for others. Teach me to pray for my enemies. Teach me to pray in public. Some of us struggle with that. To bow our heads in a circle of three or four people or to lead our family in prayer. Teach us to pray in public, Lord. Teach me to pray for strangers in the middle of Kroger. Teach me to pray. Look again at Paul's words. He says, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying. Be alert and always keep on praying. I, I don't want you to miss this admonishment to be alert. Prayer helps us to stay spiritually awake. We need to be alert because we have just studied Ephesians chapter 6. We are in a spiritual battle. When you're in a battle, you stay alert. You don't want a surprise attack from the enemy. Y'all, when we advance the gospel, when people come to Christ, as they are, hallelujah, through this ministry, when that happens, I just want you to understand, that means we have been somehow, somewhere up in the enemy's territory. Jesus is literally building his church on territory that has been occupied by an enemy. We are not people that Satan takes kindly to. When we seek to help these people who have been held hostage by Satan, when we see them become free to walk in newness with Christ, we get a target on our back, so we better stay awake so that we can stay wise to the devil's scheme, so that we can take our stand. Paul said, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying. We need to pray at all times for all kinds of requests with the spirit of perseverance. Y'all, we need to keep on praying. The person who gives up on prayer eliminates another weapon in your spiritual arsenal. Prayerlessness will lead to carelessness, and carelessness will lead to sin. That may sound dramatic, may sound overly judgmental, but it's true. Prayer keeps us connected to the presence of God, which is the source of our power. 
When we seek him regularly, we stay connected to all that he can supply. And sometimes that supply is encouragement to stay the course. Sometimes it includes power to avoid temptation. Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. They didn't watch, they didn't pray, they slept. As I was preparing this, I got to thinking, how different would their response have been to Jesus' arrest if they had actually really watched him agonize and overcome in the place of prayer? If they saw Jesus being arrested and led off to be tried, but understood he had already gained the victory, would it have changed their response? He was not beginning his trials when they led him off. He was not beginning the beatings and the crucifixion from a place of defeat. He was walking into that whole scene from a place of victory. If the disciples had understood that, maybe nobody would have gotten their ear cut off. Maybe none of them would have scattered in fear. I don't know. But if they could have seen Jesus fully surrender to God and then be ministered to by an angel, they slept through that. If they had seen that, I think they would have reacted differently. It's not always easy to pray. Sometimes it's agonizing to pray. It was agonizing for Jesus. But if you will agonize in prayer... You will gain the victory, even though you may have to walk through the fire like Jesus did. We have to keep on praying. Don't be discouraged if you pray and an answer doesn't come by the end of the week. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 tells us to pray without ceasing. I've been praying for a million-dollar giver for this church for maybe 14 years, and I'm not giving up on praying for that. Because God told me to pray for that. I prayed for a situation for almost five years. And about two months ago, there was a major shift. I prayed for three years for a place to become a senior pastor. But when I started praying that prayer, this church had a pastor. God can work in a moment in time. But he often works overtime because he is moving people out of places and into places to make room for your prayer request. You got to give him time to work and persevere in the place of prayer. I also think that we're supposed to be personally impacted by the content of our prayers. And that happens as you persevere and you continue to pray for the same burden, the same family, the same prodigal, your heart begins to beat with the heartbeat of God when you persevere in prayer. Matthew 7, Shane, you are all over my message tonight. Matthew 7, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. It's interesting that in the original language, perhaps you know that ask, seek, and knock are all written in a present tense. Keep asking, it's keep seeking, it's keep knocking, it's keep persevering. Jesus indicates that we should be people who persist in prayer. That we should keep coming to God for the things that we need and desire. Your heart will grow for the things for which you are persisting in prayer. That loved one, you think you can't love them anymore. You just spend time daily in prayer for them and just watch your heart expand. Persist for your kids. Persist for them and your love will grow beyond what you ever thought possible. Persist in prayer for an enemy and you're going to start to see them in the same light that God does. We need to persevere in prayer. So that God can shape our hearts and our thoughts toward people and circumstances. And pray in the spirit 
on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. The last part of this verse tells us to pray for the Lord's people. We have got to have each other's backs. We need to bear one another's burdens. We need to cover each other in prayer. Paul had learned about the power of prayer, the benefit of prayer, and as he instructed the Ephesians, he was doing that as a result of his personal experience with prayer. In Ephesians 1.16, he said, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. He prayed continuously for the people he loved, for the people he was ministering to. Paul had a prayer list, and he prayed at all times for the people on his list Y'all, there is no shortage of people to pray for. Alistair Begg is a Scottish minister who has pastored in Cleveland, Ohio since the early 1980s. He shares the story of a friend named T.S. Mooney who has since died and has gone on to heaven. Mooney was a bachelor his entire life. He was a banker. He taught a boys' Bible class. He lived in Northern Ireland, Ireland, and one day, Beg, Pastor Beg, asked Mooney, what's your plan and purpose for these boys? To which Mooney replied, my plan for the Bible class has always been to give every boy a Bible in his hand, a Savior in his heart, and a purpose in his life. Mooney routinely prayed for each boy in his class, and he kept in touch with them even as they grew up. Begg said that when he visited Mooney in his apartment one day, Mooney had photos of men who were judges, surgeons, teachers, mechanics, plumbers, all sorts of professions, all of whom were influenced by not only Mooney's teaching, but by his prayer. Mooney died in 1986, and his housekeeper found him in the morning, fully dressed and kneeling over his bed. As she pulled Mooney back from the bed, she found a little black book alongside his Bible, and it contained the names of all of the boys, now men, who had gone through his classes, along with the other people and the ministries that he prayed for regularly. I ask you tonight, whose ministry is being held on, uh, held up by the strength of our disciplined commitment to pray? What a privilege we have to pray for people to become fully committed followers of Christ. Y'all, what would happen in our kids' ministry, in, in our youth ministry, if every young person had two or three Christian, Jesus-loving people passionately praying for them every day to earnestly seek to follow God in his will? Wow. Look at Paul's last two verses in this Armor of God section, verse 19. Pray also for me. That whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians while he was in prison. Notice that he didn't ask them to pray that he would be released from prison. How quick are we to ask for a request that leads to our comfort. Paul saw beyond where he was. He saw beyond his situation, even though it wasn't desirable. He saw an opportunity to advance the gospel. My brothers and sisters, everything you go through is an opportunity for you to grow through it and to give Jesus to someone else. Paul said, pray that I'll be an effective preacher in prison. If that's where you've got me, that's where I want the gospel to advance. Pray that I will have boldness to continue to talk to people about Jesus. I think Paul prayed that way because he had the proper view of a believer's role in the world. And it is to wage war on the enemy of people's souls. The more Paul could talk about Jesus the more people could be liberated from Satan. Oh, Paul prayed battle-worthy prayers. He made battle-worthy requests. Do a study sometime on the prayers of Paul. 
I led a series off that topic now many years ago. Be inspired by the commitment to prayer that he exhibited. One final thought on prayer. I, I often pray that God will go ahead of me. That song, I am not alone, that we sang, you will go before me, you will never leave me. When you read the Old Testament, you read about the commitment that God had, the covenant that he had with his people. He was always one to go ahead and to prepare the way for them. When you walk into a situation that has potential to produce anxiety in you, or maybe you feel like it's a hostile situation, where you might have to deal with conflict or some personal threat. Maybe you just feel like a fish out of water. You feel awkward in a certain situation. Know that you can pray that God will go ahead of you and make a way for you to carry him into the room in a way that compels people to know him. Let's pray that God will help us carry him where we work, where we live, where we play. Jesus, thank you for this mechanism, this life-giving line to you, connection to you, this real, personal, intimate vehicle. Lord, we don't want to take this opportunity to talk to you for granted. To know, Lord, that when we pray, the power that raised Christ from the dead, that lives in us, becomes activated. Prayer activates the power of God. Jesus, I pray that you would help us to gain a boldness, to become a people not only of proclamation, but a people of prayer, people who are quick to say, let me pray about that. How can I pray for you? And to take time in the presence of our friends and in to take time in the presence of those that we are trying to win to, to bring them to the Lord. Jesus, I have seen miracles this week. How you've brought along someone who had a very tragic accident, shattered much of his face, and how doctors didn't think they would have too much to work with to reconstruct the bottom part of his face and how he texted his family a picture, and we saw evidence that you had heard and answered prayer. You are still doing amazing things, and we have an opportunity to be part of those. Help us to not discount the weapon that prayer becomes when we utilize it. Because Lord, when we pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of requests that means we are conscious that you are walking with us in the battle and we know that the battle is yours you have already won the victory take us where we could never go in our prayer life help this not be a lesson a moment in time a church experience where we thought about something for a few moments but lord help us to translate what we've heard today into something meaningful that will make a difference in our daily life. And I ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I hope you've been encouraged to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I'm really glad that you've come. We have a special gift for you, and I think we have enough for everyone. I think we have 150, but it could be iffy. Uh, there are a lot of people here tonight. So maybe um, if you're here with a spouse, take one per family until we see if we have enough. But what we have for you is an Armor of God coin to put in your pocket, put in your purse, put on your nightstand to remind you of the teaching that you've received here to put on the full armor of God. And just to be mindful that when you carry that coin, being, being aware that the Holy Spirit is with you, that he's your protector, your defender, and that he's got you. So, as we close the service tonight, you know I'll invite you to meet someone you don't know on your way forward. But come forward. If we could have a few more lights up, come forward and take one of the coins um, off of the table. And until I see you again, may the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Good night, everybody.